butterflies and moths. A lot of people still don't really know how to tell the difference. Um, I get a lot of people showing me photos of butterflies and saying, is that a moth? And a lot of people showing me photos of moths and going, look at this beautiful butterfly. So I'm going to tell you just quickly how to tell the difference. Now, I use this photo here. If you can see this here, this beautiful Madagascan moth on the left hand side there. That's right, that's a moth. This here is a moth. Some of our moths are spectacular. You would never think that was a moth. That's a Madagascan moth. Obviously, we don't get them here. It's from Madagascar. Um, but these little guys on the right here, they're from around here, and they're butterflies. So just to show you how deceiving they can be, the big beautiful one over there is a moth. This little shabby thing here that's probably about that big is a butterfly. So I'm going to tell you how to tell the difference in a moment. But really, what it comes down to is the fact that there's not a great deal of difference. So there's been some recent research that's come out of the Maguire Centre in Florida. And the research shows that there's really not a great deal of difference at all between the butterflies and the moths. And in actual fact, there's more difference between different family groups of moths than there is between some of the butterfly family groups and other moths. So I need to stop thinking about butterflies and moths and start thinking about Lepidoptera which is all butterflies and moths, because they are all practically one in the same. There is not a great deal of difference between them. But how do we tell the difference? So here we have a butterfly and we have a moth. There are a few fundamental things that you need to look at and think about when you're wanting to know whether or not your photograph or the specimen that you have is a butterfly or a moth. And that comes down to the antennae. So a butterfly's antennae always has a long narrow filament with a little hook or a club at the end of it. Whereas a moth, and you might need a hand lens sometimes to see this, has these sort of feathery antennae. That's the number one thing to look for. All these other misconceptions about butterflies flying in the day and moths flying at night, that's not true at all. There are a lot of day flying moths and there are a couple of butterflies that are actually active at night too. The cabbage white, or as some people would call it, the cabbage moth, which is actually a butterfly, can fly at night too. So there's these misconceptions there that people have that aren't true at all. Another way in um, telling the difference is the positioning of the wings when they are resting. As you can see there, the butterfly on the left, they tend to have their wings spread out wide. Um, sometimes they'll have them up if they're still pretty cold and they're waiting for the sun to come out. But moths in general, they have their wings facing backwards along the length of their body. But that can also be a misconception too, because there's always, especially in the insect world, things that are thrown out there for you just to confuse you, I'm sure. Um, and then you have their casing. So a butterfly has a chrysalis, a moth has a cocoon. But if you've got a picture of a butterfly, well, you're not going to be able to see that anyway. So number one way to tell the difference between a butterfly and a moth is the antennae. That's what you should be looking at. The other thing is a proboscis. So we all know butterflies have a proboscis. If it has a proboscis, it is definitely going to be a butterfly or a moth. It's not going to be anything else. Most moths have a proboscis, but there is a, a grouping of moths that actually have chewing mouth parts as well. And then there are some moths that don't have mouths at all, which doesn't make much sense, but they do most of their feeding in the larval stage. Um, so when you're looking at identification, um, there are certain parts of the butterfly that, or the moth that you're looking at um, and usually that comes down to the wing but again as you can see there the antennae that is the difference between the moth and the butterfly the number one factor so always look for that first and foremost when you're doing butterfly identification there are a few things that we look at we look at the antenna we look at the patterns on the hind wing we look at the patterns on the forewing, and that's it. Um, so Australian butterfly families, we've got about 654 taxa. That means all species and subspecies of butterflies in Australia. Um, we have got five main family groups of butterflies. We've got the pyridae, or the whites, which people would know the cabbage white up the top there. We've got the swallowtails, which people would be familiar with the citrus swallowtail that lays its eggs on your lemon tree or your, your orange tree. Um, we've got 34 taxa of swallowtails. 
We've got the skippers, which are little butterflies that kind of resemble moths and they, they get mistaken for moths quite a lot. Uh, we've got the brown butterflies or the Nymphalidae family and we've got the Lycanidae family or the blue butterfly family. So five main family groups and amongst all of those family groups we've got about 650 different species and subspecies of butterflies, which isn't all that many. I'm going to Ecuador at the end of the year and I'm going to one place, one reserve that has 1,500 species of butterflies in that one reserve. So I'm going to be a little bit overwhelmed. But what that means is really, for what we've got in Victoria, which is roughly about 130 species, there's no reason why you can't learn them all. You might have to spend your Friday evenings looking at butterfly books, like some of us do. But um, there's no reason why you can't at least learn about the common ones that you have. So I'm going to just quickly go through some of those now. So in Victoria, we've got seven species of the whites. And there's five locals that you will find. There's five species of swallowtails in Victoria. There's probably three, only three that you would get here, but maybe there's one that you might get every now and then that sort of migrates through the landscape. You got um, 42 species of skippers in Victoria and probably about 12 that you would find locally. You've got 29 species of browns or nymphalidae and probably about 10 locals. Oh, hang on. Will that work if I do that? Yep, and 41 species of blue. Now the blue butterflies are my favourite. Um, the Lycanidae family is amazing. And that is because 80% of this family group of butterflies has a relationship, a mutualistic or symbiotic relationship that takes place with a species of ant. So I was talking about those relationships earlier, about wasps pollinating things, bees buzz pollinating things. These guys are relying on ant species to look after their caterpillars. And it's phenomenal. It is an amazing thing. This co-evolution that takes place out there in the wild between species is phenomenal. So the blues are my favourite. And there's about 18 species of blue that you would find locally and 41 for Victoria. Um, so I think just to speed it up a little bit, I'm just going to go through the regional list of what you might find here. So as I said, about five species of whites that you will find. You've got the caper white which is a beautiful little butterfly. This is a migratory species of butterfly. Everybody hears about the monarchs and how amazing they are because they travel vast different distances across Canada down into Mexico. It's an amazing thing to see. Um, but this little guy does it here in Australia and most people don't know about it. This species will migrate from New South Wales, top end of New South Wales down into Victoria. It'll stay here for a couple of weeks in the breeding season and mate, and then it flies back again. Its host plant doesn't even exist here in Victoria. So it comes down here purely to mate. I don't know why, I'm still trying to figure it out. I think it might have something to do with temperatures or something like that, but um, it's pretty impressive that we have migratory species here in Australia. The sad thing is that not many people know about it. Uh, so this is caper white. Then we have the Jezebels. These are my favourite whites, the Imperial and the Spotted Jezebel. Um, and these guys use mistletoe as a host plant. So as I was saying earlier, a lot of our endangered butterfly species or our rarer butterfly species actually use mistletoe. It is important in the landscape. So when I say host plant, what I mean is as an adult, the butterfly will feed on almost anything. Anything that's producing a good amount of nectar, they'll be happy with. But the larva, the caterpillars, some species are so specific that the caterpillar will only be laid, its eggs will only be laid on a particular species of plant. And for these guys, it's mistletoe. So the adult butterfly does not lay her eggs anywhere else. Maybe on cherry ballarts from time to time, but mistletoe is the mo main host plant for this species. So we need our mistletoe in the landscape. So uh, these are native Australian butterflies? Yes. On mistletoe, which is an imported No, plant. mistletoe no. is a native species. Native, is it? Yep, most oh, definitely, right. yes. So it's different from the mistletoe in oh, north, yeah, north, yeah, north yeah. the Northern Yep, our mistletoe is a native and we've got quite a lot of species. I don't know if I bought my mistletoe book. Um, but yeah, native, Sorry, they need to stay there. Leave your mistletoes on your trees. Um, host plant for some of our rarer butterflies. It's essential stuff. And like I said, birds, insects, we need our mistletoe. Yep. So um, the other thing I worry about with this species is if you have a look there at the larva, you can see this here. What does that resemble to a lot of people? That caterpillar there. Spitfire, yeah, that looks very much like a spitfire to me. 
Um, and I worry about these species because I'm wondering how many of these caterpillars are getting pulled off trees and killed because people think that they're spitfires and they're actually not. So I guess that the thing is, is learn about what you've got before you act on it really is what it comes down to. If you see a plant, you think it's a weed, but you're not sure, but you think it might be, don't dig it up just because you think it might be. Get a book, <laughs> learn about it, identify it. If you're really not sure, send a sample into the museum and, or the herbarium and get them to actually identify it for you. Not from the larvae? Oh, not from the larvae, I'm talking about plants. So if, you, you know, if you're looking at something you think it's a weed, you don't know, ask somebody. If you can't get an answer, send your specimen off to the herbarium and they will tell you exactly what it is. They'll tell you whether it's a weed or not before you dig it up. So learn what you've got before you act on it. Because you might be wrong. You might actually be removing these beautiful butterfly species from your garden or your landscape because you think it's a spitfire. Um, cabbage white, this is actually an introduced species. There aren't very many introduced butterfly species, but this one is. Um, I don't ever think that butterflies would get completely out of control, that they would become an invasive pest. But um, these guys are obviously pests in our veggie garden. So this is one of the few butterfly species that I'm okay with saying, you know, if you grow on your veggies, you know, whatever. I didn't hear it. Um, but yeah, there, this is a, another misconception. This is not a moth, it is a butterfly. But maybe they're so closely related that it doesn't matter anyway. Uh, small grass yellow is a lovely little, little butterfly. Um, you would have that around here. This one would occur in your garden sometimes too. Um, very small and it is also a migratory species. So a lot of our butterflies do actually move through the landscape. Some of them, especially the small blues um, and the small skippers are so specific that they will only be in a particular area where some of the bigger ones that can move vast distances will actually travel across Australia. So we do have some migratory species. So what's the life span of a butterfly? Well, that very much differs from one species to the next. So the monarch butterfly, for example, will stay a butterfly for about 12 months, um, whereas the small Altham copper butterfly, which is an endangered species, would only be an adult butterfly for between two and four weeks, depending on the season as well. Depending. Yeah, well, it, it does, it varies depending on the species and its, um, I guess, the habitat that it's living in, whether or not it migrates. And then you've got other things like, you know, whether or not it gets eaten by a cat. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so th there's, it, it does vary quite a lot. Um, then we've got our swallowtail family, which these are the bigger, beautiful, showy butterflies that we have. So there's five species in Victoria, three, maybe four, that you would have here in Central Vic. Um, they're very large butterflies, and I will, like I said, just try and scoot through them pretty quickly. But these are the three that you'll be seeing here. So you've got the dainty swallowtail on the top left-hand corner there, which often gets called dingy swallowtail, but I don't ever call it that because it's not dingy at all. Um, you've got the orchard swallowtail. Those two require citrus as a host plant, and they will utilise your lemon trees, your orange trees, kumquats and things like that. And then you've got the checkered swallowtail down the bottom there, which is usually found up in the canopy feeding, um, but will actually lay its eggs on a scurf pea, on a cullen. So cullen tenax, cullen, throw some cullens at me. Parvum, cullen parvum is another host plant for this species. Um, then we have the skippers, which is our small butterflies that are mostly resembled, are mostly um, mistaken for moths. These guys have got very distinct ways in which they behave. So their flight behaviour will actually tell you that you might be looking at a skipper. Um, and I identify them by their large buffy heads that they've got. It's the only way I can describe it. I didn't bring my butterfly collection along with me and I wish I had it so I could show you some of these. Um, but they do have very buffy heads. And the way that you tell the difference between a skipper and the other butterflies is the positioning of its antenna. So, um, the, the skippers have antenna that actually come down to an apex and start from a central point on the butterfly's head, whereas most other butterflies will have a bit of spacing between the antenna. So normal butterfly, skipper. That's pretty much how you, or not normal butterfly, other types of butterflies and skippers. So that's how they get identified. And large buffy heads, and they have sort of fast 
rapid jerky movements when they're flying around and you'll find them mostly on your, um, your grasses and your shrub layer. But there's 42 species in Victoria and probably about 12 for the area. That's your list of species that I would expect to find around here. I won't show you all of them, but here's a couple of pictures of some that you might see. This is an heath, a heath ochre. Um, the, the thing with these guys is that they are really, really small and that's why they do get mistaken for moths quite a lot. I'll show you a few pictures there, a montane ochre. You might notice that most of the host plants for these guys are grasses and lamandras and things like that. So incorporate them into your reveg and you'll get these butterflies as well. So again, lamandra is a host plant. This species here is actually listed. Um, this is an FFG listed species, so it's quite endangered. Um, varied sedge skipper, that uses a saw sedge as a host plant. White banded grass dart, again native um, grasses, but also uses some introduced grasses. Greenish grass dart, this guy's the most common and everybody would have this one in their garden um, throughout most of the year, probably, whenever it's sunny. And this one is easy to identify because when it's sitting, it has its hind wings flat. And when I say hind wings, that's the wings on the bottom. And then its four wings are sitting up like this. So that's the way to tell that this one is the greenish grass dart, which is the most common of all the skippers. And this is just to show you the similarities between those skippers. So they're very, very difficult to tell apart. And for me, they're like, um, they're like any Birdo's thornbills. So they're very, very difficult to tell apart. And the way in which you do it is that you have to have a specimen and you have to have a look at the different patterns and different bands and things and their position on the wing and whether or not they fall within a, a particular section. It's like dragonfly ID is very similar. Um, so there's a lot of hand lenses and, um, and looking at things under microscopes or you just have to have a really good eye. That's to scale, yeah, so that, that's saying, they're not saying they're one centimetre, they're saying that there's a scale bar there of a centimetre, so the wingspan of that one there, for example, in its entirety is about two centimetres, yeah. Um, and some of the bigger ones are a little bit bigger, but skippers are really small, and that's why they get mistaken for moths quite a lot. Um, moving on, we've got the browns or the Nymphalidae family. Um, there's about 10 species that you might find locally, and I think I've got lots of nice pictures of these guys, because you'll see a few of these in your gardens. We've got the common brown. Um, so this is a species that shows, I'm not sure if you've ever heard of it, but sexual diamorphism. It's whereby you have a male and a female, and they're almost very, very different, so different that you would think they were a different species. So in the top left there, you've got a female common brown species. In the bottom right there, you've got a male. So if you saw those out in the bush or in your garden, you would think they were two separate species of butterflies. And what you're seeing also is the difference between the, um, the top view of the wings and the underside of the wings. And in most identification for butterfly species, you need to see what this looks like and what this looks like to be able to identify it from a book. So you need to see the underside and the top of the wing. So if you're going to take a photo and you want to find out what it is you're looking at, you really need to have a photo of both. It can be quite tricky. Um, we have the meadow argus. Everybody's seen this gorgeous little thing. I'm just going to scoot through them really quickly. I won't talk about them too much. Um, but these are all the most common ones. Everybody knows the monarch. We've got two types of monarchs in Australia. We've got the lesser wanderer that's on the left there, and then we've got the monarch that everybody knows. The lesser wanderer is actually a really beautiful butterfly if you get a chance to see it. Painted lady is another very common species. Yellow admiral. And this is my favourite of the browns, the tailed emperor, which most people probably haven't ever had the privilege of seeing. This guy flies so high up in the canopy that um, it's, it's a very rare occurrence that you might actually see it, but is one of the most spectacular butterflies I've ever seen. Um, and then we have the blue family group. So as I said, about 15 species probably that you would find locally. That's the list there, but I won't go into them too much. But they can be quite varied in the way that they look. Um, you've got a long-tailed pea blue on the left there. That's, um, you know, it's probably only about this big. Um, got nice blue to brown hues on the top wings and then underside with the blues you really need to see the underside of the wing to be able to identify them. Um, there's a saltbush blue in the middle there, um, a candelides on the right which is a pea blue I think 
um, and then you've got a hair streak down the bottom which is really beautiful. As I said, there's quite a few species for this family group. Um, this is probably one of the more common ones you will see. So the, the small blues family or the Lycanidae family is known as the blues and the coppers because sometimes they're a coppery colour, sometimes they're a blue. So this is a chequered copper which is a pretty common species. Um, this is the most common of all the blues which is a small grass blue that you will see in your lawns, in your garden. You know in the summers when it's nice and warm you see lots of little blue butterflies all skitting about together it's more than likely that this is the one you're seeing here. Um, this is a wattle blue, a salt bush blue, fringe teeth blue, um, and then there's many others. And of all the endangered butterfly species that we have in Victoria, 90% of them actually belong to the blue family group or the Lacanidae family. And that is based on the fact that they have that relationship that takes place with another species. So when you've got You've got a butterfly species that has specific requirements for its host plant, but then it also is relying on another insect to help look after it. It just means that the, the number of factors that can go wrong in the environment increase dramatically. So it's not just about it having its host plant available, but it's also about it having its attendant ant around, and it's about making sure that that whole ecosystem is maintained properly for each of those factors. So again, it comes down to the message I'm trying to get home is you need to have large patches of bush and you need to have decent connectivity between those large patches. If you've got that, then you're heading in the right direction. Um, and so the other thing that you can do for butterflies is plant their host plants. If you provide host plants, then the butterflies will come. So, you know, they can fly. If your host plant is in your garden, if their host plant is in your garden, then they're likely to come. So, you know, lemon trees will bring citrus swallowtails. Cullens and peas will bring checkered swallowtails. Heaths and things like that will bring some of those smaller blues. Your peas, your heaths, all of those things. So really, variety. I guess that's the spice of life, isn't it? As many different species as you possibly can incorporate those things into reveg. Not just some yukis and a couple of wattles. We need everything. We need the lot. We need the grasses, the lamandras, the sedges. We need the, the heaths and the herbs and all of the stuff that should be there needs to be there. So start thinking about butterflies when you're planting, even in your gardens, in your urban environments as well. I've got lots of host plants in my garden and I live in the middle of Bendigo. Um, so oh, I won't go through the threats. Um, but as I said, uh, we've got 130 species of butterflies roughly in Victoria and 20% of those are listed under one of those forms of legislation. That's 20% of Victoria's butterflies are in danger. That's scary for me. And that's just the butterflies. You know, that's definitely something that's worth... It's just a brief extinction. Well, I, I like that's to scare people. Danger. Yep. It is, as far as I see it, we have all of our flora and fauna is in danger. It's all threatened because there's nothing left. You know, like I said, Central Vic, less than 15% left. That's in danger. When we've got 20% of the species listed and recognised by our government that they're rare and threatened, that's, to me, on the brink of extinction. Some of these things will go extinct in my lifetime, I'm sure of it. Unless you can do something about it and encourage people to help. And that's why I'm here, I guess. So... That's about it. I won't go any further into the butterfly stuff. But this is the field guide you want to get here by Ross Fields. This is another really good one. This is an Australia-wide field guide by Michael Braby. And this is my favourite butterfly book. Um, it's just a really nice table book, which is by Kitchen. Um, it's all hand-drawn, uh, beautiful descriptions and things. It's actually really nice to have on your coffee table. It's a great way to learn. Um, and the museum website is another way to find out information. They actually have a system whereby you can um, pull off maps of all the species in your area. There's a, an identification key as well. So if you see something and you're not sure what it is, you can just tick some boxes through this identification key and it'll tell you what it is likely that you're looking at. And that's about it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.